Father, you said to call upon you in the day of trouble. You would deliver us and we would glorify you. And there are our troubles. It was your own son who said that when the word is preached, then the devil comes. Father, I know that the devil would seek to take seeds from out of heart so that people would not believe and be saved. We ask that you would help us. Father, I know that you gave Lydia grace to pay attention and she was saved. Father, you are the one who opens eyes and you are the one who encourages your people. You're the one who sends your spirit to help us And I pray that you would, through the preaching of your word, Father, do what no human being can do. We are dependent upon you. We trust in you. We look to you. We thank you. Amen. Christianity. It's a battle. We were looking earlier and we saw in Ephesians 6 that we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, powers, spiritual wickedness in the heavenly places. We know that there are schemes of the devil and we're warned. We're warned to be aware of them. We're warned that the devil prowls around like a roaring lion seeking who he would devour. We need to be alert. And one of the ways that we can be alert is by being aware. Uh, He lies to us. And he lies to us about many things. One of the things that the enemy lies to us about, he lies to us about ourselves. He, he, He tells Christians that they're not, and he tells lost men that they are. He accuses us. He seeks to deceive us about our own hearts. He lies to us about the church. He, he would tell us that those people don't really care about you. They, they, they didn't say hi to you because they don't like you. Just stay home. You're a burden to them. Don't bother them. Don't bring up your prayer concerns. They don't care. But most tragically of all, he lies to us about God. I mean, this is the greatest evil that he whispers to us because what we think about God matters. Right? I mean, it literally affects and impacts everything that we do. How we interact with God has a direct connection to what we think about Him. How you pray is directly connected to how you view God, how you give, how you deal with suffering, how you worship. So, how do you view God? Do you view him accurately? As your bulletin says, I want to focus on one particular area of our view of God, and that is the generosity of God. Now this is what's true of our Lord. He is the ruler of all. Right? God is king. We were singing it earlier. Crown him with many crowns. Even if we don't crown him, he is the king. Even if we don't recognize his kingship, his lordship, his sovereignty, his authority, that is who he is. He rules and reigns. His throne is in heaven and he is over all. And yet, in spite of this fact, mankind rebels. It's an amazing thing. God is the one who made men and men do not worship the God who made them. He is the one who has made all things, who owns all things. The Bible says that he owns a cattle on a thousand hills. Now, we know that that doesn't mean a thousand and one is owned by someone else. This is a a term to signify the reality that God owns everything. And he's under no obligation to give rebellious, wicked, sin-loving, God-hating sinners anything but justice. Men hate God. Romans 1 literally defines mankind in a list of sins as haters of God. We say that, but I don't know if it really sinks in what we're saying. Think about what you hate. Some children hate certain vegetables so much so that they don't even want them on their plate. Don't even put it on the table. I hate the sight of it. 
I grew up with a strong hatred for rats. I don't want to be in a room, in a building, in the same city. <laughs> Keep them away from me. We talk about hate groups. But you know what the greatest hate group is? It's mankind. Mankind hates God. They hate God so much that they replace the true and living God with an imaginary one. One that they like. God created man in his image and men create their God in their image. But I was talking to the children the other day. You know what's even worse than an, 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 an angry, violent, focused hatred? Is utter neglect. Men ignore God. They treat Him as though He doesn't exist. And I was asking myself and others, there, is, there, there are far uh, more offensive things than uh, being attacked, like being ignored. You know, if, if someone sends you a text message and they read it and they respond with an angry response, at least they're acknowledging that you exist. They're interacting. But when you see that they read your text and they just ignored it, you're like, hey, don't I exist here? You just walk by me. You don't see me. You don't speak to me. You don't acknowledge me. Men treat God in this way. And yet, in spite of all of this, God is generous to his enemies. So I'm going to take you through a number of passages and a number of areas as we look at the first point that God is generous to the lost. You can turn there or you can just write these down or listen along. 1 Timothy 6.13 He says, I charge you in the presence of God who gives life to all things and of Christ Jesus who in his testimony before Pontius Pilate made the good confession. Focusing thereon, God who gives life to all things. God gives life. And we'll turn to Acts 17. Twenty-four. The God who made the world and everything in it, being Lord of heaven and earth, does not live in temples made by man, nor is he served by human hands as though he needed anything. Notice this. Since he himself gives to all mankind life and breath and everything. We have established the fact that men hate God. They blaspheme God. They reject God. They mock Christ. They love this world. And yet, all mankind receives from God life and breath and everything. Breath is given by God. G life is given by God and everything that it takes for there to be life. You think of your digestive system and the blood circulating through your veins and the brain functioning and all of that, the cells and the atoms and all those things that are going on. It's because God is making that happen, giving that to men, even men who hate him. It's an amazing thing to think about because if for one moment, the one who upholds all things, holds all things together, said, I will stop this, every one of us would drop dead. Every breath, every inhale and exhale is given to men by God. But ask yourself, how many breaths have you taken since you've been in here? You know, the reality is we tell our children, say thank you, right? If someone gives you something, say thank you. Even if you don't like it, it's just kind to be grateful and thankful. The very fact that breath, without breath, you would die. Men would die without breath. God gives breath. Every single inhale and exhale is from him, and yet we don't even keep count. We don't even know how many breaths we've taken since we've been in this room. 
He supplies life and breath and everything. And again, what we're emphasizing right now is he's giving this to his enemies, people who hate him. Psalm 104 and verse 14 and 15, he says, You cause the grass to grow for the livestock and plants for man to cultivate, that he may bring forth food from the earth and wine to gladden the heart of man, oil to make his face shine, and bread to strengthen man's heart. You know what else God gives besides life and breath? He gives food and drink. Lost men and women and children eat. All peoples, regardless of how they serve him, in spite of their opposition to him, in spite of their rebellion against him, our Father is generous to the lost, letting them eat and drink to grow food and enjoy their food. Think of all the restaurants. Me and Michael got to go enjoy some food yesterday. It's filled with people. Most of them probably haters of God. And food is good. I mean, God didn't make food like bland and one color and it's just energy no think of the colors and the smells and the different textures think of the the all the different culinary ideas from food from india and mexico and pakistan and italy and i mean it's just abounding with all of these differences and it's wonderful and it's beautiful and my life my wife and i we were laughing because even on commercials, they show food slow motion and it's dripping and, it, and you're there drooling and you can't even smell it. The food just looks good. It's an enjoyable thing. And sinners eat and drink. Their taste buds burst with pleasure as they eat their favorite dish. He even feeds our food so that we can eat it. He supplies grass to the cows. He supplies nutrients to the vegetables. What about marriage? Genesis 2.18, The Lord God said, It is not good that the man should be alone. I will make him a helper fit for him. In Proverbs 18.22, He who finds a wife finds a good thing and obtains favor from the Lord. Now we know Marriage is a picture of Christ and his church. This is the purpose of it. This mystery is profound, Ephesians 5 says, but I speak concerning Christ and his church. That's the reason for this. All things exist for him. It's all about him. Marriage is about him. Here's a husband, a picture of Christ. Here's the bride, a picture of the church. And in our church, we've been blessed to have two weddings so far this year, and we have another one next week. And you know the reality is, Marriage is good. It's enjoyable. There are, there's much to enjoy in marriage, and it's not restricted to Christians. Lost people enter into marriage day in and day out, and all the pleasures of the marriage bed, all the enjoyment of relationship and community and talking and communication and having someone there, a shoulder to cry on, someone that you can trust in, sharing experiences and memories and all of that, is and can be enjoyed by the people who hate the God that made them. He's generous. The wicked still marry, and they don't care anything about purity. They don't care anything about holiness. They don't care anything about God or his word. They care nothing about the symbolism of what marriage is meant to convey. And yet they still enjoy and participate in this. Children. Children, behold, children are a heritage from the Lord, the fruit of the womb, a reward. Psalm 127.3. It's a blessing to have a child, to have children. I have been in rooms where someone has, has died, and there's weeping and sorrow, and it seems as though this is, this is so overwhelmingly sad. And then some child will say the wrong thing at the right time and the room bursts into laughter. Children have that ability. New parents, they just look at the, they don't want to watch TV anymore. Just looking at their baby, look, she blinked. You know, there, there's just an enjoyment with children, life. And 
you see them grow and you look at a child's face and you see your face. Well, you, they look just like my father. They look like a combination of us. The enjoyment of raising children is not only given to Christians. Lost people are able to bring children into this world and enjoy the laughter and the pleasure and the enjoyment and the experiences of raising children. That is a generosity supplied by the King of Kings. He's generous. What about work? Some you say, work, that's not enjoyable. What's so enjoyable about that? You know, Monday's coming, oh, Monday's. But no, you know, before the fall, there was work. Adam was given a job. He was supplied with giving names to all the animals. He was to cultivate the, the, the garden. He had work before the fall. The fall gave us a a, a, a sinful attitude towards work and there's thorns and thistles in order to bring forth food and sweat of our brow but there's an enjoyment in work Ecclesiastes 3.22 says so I saw that there is nothing better than that a man should rejoice in his work for that is his lot who can bring him to see what will be after him the fact of the matter is that people can enjoy their work they can take pleasure in what they do. They can put their hands to do something and enjoy it. And not only that, not only can you do something, improve upon it, gain these skills, but you can get paid for it. The wicked do this all the time. That's the generosity of God. And think of all the ways. It's not just one kind of work. Everyone doesn't have to be a farmer. There are barbers and beauticians. There are electricians and architects. There are engineers. There are astronauts, construction workers, chefs, bus drivers, custodians, musicians, painters, teachers, lawyers, police officers, soldiers, and we can go on and on. Millions and millions of ways to earn a living. In fact, all of us right now are wearing something that somebody worked to produce. You're sitting in something that someone worked to produce. You're listening to me now because somebody worked and produced this amplification system. Deuteronomy 8.18 says, You shall remember the Lord your God, for it is He who gives you the power to get wealth, that He may confirm His covenant that He swore to your fathers as it is this day. People who hate God are supplied with the gift to enjoy their work and to be paid for it. That's to say nothing of the enjoyment of the seasons. The beauty of winter. The beauty of spring. Driving here, there are the blue bonnets. Beautiful. Indian paintbrushes, beautiful. You see the different colors. You, you hear the birds chirping. You see the, the buzzing and the butterflies and all of that. That is an enjoyable thing to experience and lost people can enjoy it. It's enjoyable in the summer to go swimming. It's enjoyable in autumn to see the different trees changing color. It's an enjoyable thing. I grew up on the East Coast where it snowed and You can hold a snowflake. You can put your tongue out and catch them on your tongue. These are things that lost people can enjoy. The Lord Jesus talked about how he lets his sun shine on the just and on the unjust. He lets his rain fall on the good as well as the evil. Jeremiah 5.24 says, They do not say in their hearts, Let us fear the Lord our God who gives the rain in its season, the autumn rain and the spring rain, and keeps for us the weeks appointed for the harvest. God is supplying rain, seasons, spring, and yet they don't say in their hearts, let us fear God. The beauty of creation, to look up in the sky and see the starry host, to look at the mountains. We were singing about it earlier. The beauty of music. We, we, we were enjoying these different instruments, and it doesn't matter what kind of musical style you like. If you grew up, well, I did, on the boom bap of hip hop, or you like the classical instruments of a symphony, the reality is music and sound and rhythm and rhyme, art. How about a nap? 
Have you ever just been tired and enjoy a good nap? Lost people can nap. They can take a a break. They can have a good laugh. Memory, the ability to recall things. Again, we can go on and on and on. What I'm trying to illustrate to you is look at the generosity of our God to people who hate him. 1 Corinthians 4, 7, For who sees anything different in you? What do you have that you did not receive? If then you received it, why do you boast as if you did not receive it? God in his supreme mercy gives these gifts to men day after day after day, and yet they boast in their pride, their arrogance, and he gives still. It's not in their power. It's not in their diet. It's not in their wisdom. It's not in their efforts that keep these gifts coming. It is only because of the generosity and the kindness and the mercy of an angry and rejected and a holy God. And may I add to it this? He gives without being asked. Lost people don't ask God for breath. Can I have another breath, God? They don't say, can you keep my heart beating? They don't say, can you let the sun rise again? Can you let me see a flower? Can you let me enjoy music? They don't ask him, and yet he gives and gives and gives. And he gives without being thanked. If somebody doesn't thank us, we're ready to take our ball and go home. What? You're not appreciative? Okay, I see how it is. But they don't thank him. They don't ask him. And they don't thank him, and yet his generosity overflows. This is our God. He's generous in ways that we cannot even begin to fathom. And yet, with all the generosity that the wicked receive, if they don't repent, all this does is make the day of judgment worse for them. Right? The kindness of God is meant to lead somewhere. To, to, to experience and enjoy all of these things is meant to lead somewhere. Romans says it's meant to lead to repentance. And so when God is being kind and generous and you have hated him and mocked him and spit in his face and used him and neglected him and ignored him and used his very gifts against him and he continues to be kind, that's meant to break your heart and bend your knee and surrender. Oh Lord, I am unworthy of such kindness. That's what it's meant to produce. God is generous to the lost. Christian, God has given you all of this and infinitely more. He has given you eternal life. Romans 6.23, for the wages of sin is death, but what? The free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. Christian, not only do you get all that the lost get in the realities of life, but he supplies you with eternal life as a gift. You don't earn it. You don't work for it. It's not something that you're owed. It is a free gift from a generous God to you. But not only does he make you alive, not only are you born again by the Spirit, not only are you brought into salvation as a gift, but he also gives the the gift of growing You start somewhere as a baby. I was talking in the the foyer to a brother earlier. As a baby, you're born again, but you don't stay a baby, right? He grows you. 1 Corinthians 3, 7, So neither he who plants nor he who waters is anything, but only God who gives growth. There's a reality that God gives growth growth. You grow in the Christian life. Your patience grows. Your love grows. Your faith grows. Your trust in Him grows. Your kindness grows. Your mercy grows. Your self-control grows. And that's a gift given by our God. He's generous to the church, to the Christian. He gives you victory over sin, Satan, this wicked world. This verse was quoted earlier, 1 Corinthians 15, 57. 
But thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. And you focus in on that language of gives us. He gives us the victory through Christ. And Christ supplies us the victory through His work. It's all a gift. It's all the generosity of our God. He's giving. He's generous. He's supplying. How about wisdom? What does James tell us? If any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask God who gives. How does He give? Generously to all without reproach, and it will be given Him. I mean, how comforting is that? You don't know what to do. You're in, a, you're, you're in a situation and you're unsure and you need wisdom. You need guidance. You need counsel. And you cry out to the living God. And he says, you need wisdom? Here you go. You need some more? Here you go. You're suffering. You don't know how to deal with this, tr- this trial. You need some wisdom? Here you go. He gives and gives and gives. And the text says, generously to all without reproach. He gives. He has given you forgiveness of sin. Colossians 1.13 He has delivered us from the domain of darkness and transferred us to the kingdom of His beloved Son in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. How many sins has He forgiven the Christian of? One? Two? Three? A million? We know the reality. What, is the, what does the song say? Full atonement can it be. Hallelujah. What a Savior. My sin, oh the bliss of this glorious thought. My sin, not in part, but the whole is nailed to the cross and I bear it no more. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord, oh my soul. This is the joy of the Christian that all of our sins have been forgiven and we know I don't deserve my sins to be forgiven. This is a gift from God to us. Not because of anything that we've done, not because of anything that we are owed, but because He's generous, He supplies forgiveness to sinners. He gives assurance that you're His. That is a gift. Romans 8, 15, For you did not receive the spirit of slavery to fall back into fear, but you have received the spirit of adoption as sons by whom we cry, Abba, Father. The Spirit Himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God. You know like I know, Christian, that there are times when you're walking through the valley of the shadow of death and you feel alone. There are times when you have disobeyed and you look up and you say, is that it? Is there any more grace? Have I exhausted? And there's the Spirit of God bearing witness with our spirit. You are a child of God. When the enemy comes and would seek to accuse you, there's the Spirit. It's like exactly what happens in Zechariah 3. You remember that picture? There's Zechariah or uh, Joshua the high priest standing before the angel of the Lord. Satan standing at his right hand to accuse him. And the Lord said to Satan, The Lord rebuke you, O Satan. The Lord who has chosen Jerusalem rebuke you. Is this not a brand plucked from the fire? And there you are before the Lord, and here comes the enemy telling you of all the guilt within and upward you look and behold him there who made an end to all your sin. There is a comfort. There is a hope. There is a joy that comes with the assurance that you know I am his and he is mine. He gives me that assurance. He gives me that witness. He gives me that confidence that I am his. It's a gift. He gives you grace and more grace. James 4, 5 Do you suppose it is to no purpose that the Scripture says He yearns jealousy over the Spirit that He has made to dwell in us? But He gives more grace. Therefore, it says, God opposes the proud but gives grace to the humble. Grace. We're saved by grace. We're brought into the fellowship of God through grace, by grace, through faith. But God doesn't stop there. It's not just saving grace. He also supplies you with power to put sin to death. There's grace. He continually pours out grace as you continue to walk in humility. 
Grace to fight, grace to kill sin, grace to love him more. He gives more and more and more grace. Again, what am I doing here? I'm trying to to communicate to you what the scriptures tell us, that our God is generous. He's generous to his enemies, but all the more children of God. He is generous to you. Very, very generous. He gives you, what else? The ministry of reconciliation. 2 Corinthians 5. 17, therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. All this is from God, who through Christ reconciled us to himself and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. In Christianity, there will be conflict. Among brothers and sisters, there will be conflict. But the greatest conflict that has ever existed has been brought to peace. God and man. And God has reconciled his people to himself. And he's given us the reality and the power that we can have reconciliation among ourselves. Because we've been forgiven, we can forgive. Because we've been loved, we can love. Because we've been shown mercy, we can give mercy. Because he was not selfish in any way, but selfless and suffered on our behalf and gave himself for us, we can no longer be self-absorbed, but we can be compelled by the love of Christ to no longer live for ourselves but to live for others to consider others higher than ourselves to think about others all the things that would cause conflict to remain he's given christians the ministry of reconciliation so that we can walk in peace and unity this is the amazing thing when you look at a book like philemon and you have a slave and a master and here we see what's happening there's going to be peace how can that be Because we sit at the table of our king and there was once enmity, but now there's peace. So we can settle any dispute. So much so that Paul would say, you don't need to go to lawyers. (laughs) Amongst one another, you have the ability to settle it all. He gives eternal comfort in Christ. 2 Thessalonians 2.16 Now... May our Lord Jesus Christ himself and God our Father who loved us and gave us eternal comfort and good hope through grace comfort your hearts and establish them in every good work and word. There's eternal comfort. The reality is in this world, there are things that can try to comfort you. If, if you have a home, that can be comforting, but that home can burn down. You can be healthy today, but you know like I know, sickness can strike you tonight and now your health is gone. You can have a job and that's comforting to know I can provide, but you can lose your job. Somebody in our church suffered from identity theft. Everything you have in the bank can be taken just like that. See, there are temporary comforts in this world, but they don't last because there's moth and there's rust and there's thief. But there is an eternal comfort that can never take away any of your comfort. What is that comfort? It's the comfort we have in Christ, knowing Him, being known by Him, the promise of eternal life, our sins being forgiven, the adoption that we have, the love that He's poured into our hearts, the promises that He's made. It's all in Christ, and that is secure. That cannot be taken away. It's an eternal comfort. The salvation that we have is eternal. And so even if you suffer a day like Job did, even if you suffer like Paul did, you can still rejoice with tears in your eyes because you know that there is a comfort that rises above this temporary world that cannot be taken away. It can't be stripped. It can't be robbed. All the promises of God find their yes in Him. And that is why. It is through him that we utter our amen to God for his glory. He has given the Christian every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ. Everything that pertains to life and godliness according to the divine, or rather by his divine power that comes through divine knowledge. It's a gift. And yet, there's more. He has given you the greatest gift of all because everything that I've described is fruit. But the root 
the greatest gift of all is that God has given you himself. There is no greater gift. There is no greater treasure. There is no greater joy. He has given you himself. 1 Thessalonians 4, 7, For God has not called us for impurity, but in holiness. Therefore, whoever disregards this, disregards not man, but God, who gives his Holy Spirit to you. And let that take your breath away. God, holy, holy, holy God, you, you who were once enemies, you who were once slaves of impurity, you who once followed the the prince of the power of the air, the course of this world, you who once were children of the devil, you who once looked at this world as your treasure, who loved sin and treasured sin and hated God, that God who is holy and pure and good and perfect would give to you his Holy Spirit. What could be greater There is nothing greater. And yet it's true. Christian, God has given you His own Spirit. What about Ezekiel 11? This new covenant promise, I will give them one heart and a new spirit I will put within them. I will remove the heart of stone from their flesh and give them a heart of flesh that they may walk in my statutes and keep my rules and obey them. And they shall be my people and I will be their God. I mean, do you remember your sin? Do you remember what you were and that God would say, I will be your God? The Hebrew says he'd not be ashamed to be called our God, that Christ would not be ashamed to be called our brother. What is this? This is an amazing thing, and it's true that God would give himself to you. We have possessions, cars, keys to our home and we would say i can't trust you with that i can't give that to you because you've shown yourself to be untrustworthy you're unworthy of such a gift and yet god has given to us himself he's given to us a knowledge of him he's given us a heart that can love him and eyes to see him. He's given us affection for him, though we would mistreat him. He's given us himself, and he would be called our God, and we would be called his people. It's amazing. Galatians 2.20, I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me and the life I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. He's given himself for you, Christian. He's generous. There is nothing more that he could give than what he's given. Titus 2.11, For the grace of God has appeared bringing salvation for all people, training us to renounce ungodliness and worldly passions, to live self-controlled, upright, and godly lives in the present age, waiting for our blessed hope, the appearing of the glory of our great God and Savior Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us to redeem us from all lawlessness and to purify for himself a people for his own possession who are zealous for good works. I mean, does it amaze you that God would want you? That he would say, I want you for my own possession. And I'm going to be yours, and you're going to be mine. And I'm going to give my son up for you. I'm going to give myself to you. I'm going to give my spirit to you. And we're going to have fellowship I'm going to love you with the same love that I love my son with. Does that still take your breath away? I pray it would because it's meant to. In fact, Ephesians tells us that we need to pray for strength, supernatural strength to comprehend the love that God has for us because it's literally out of this world and it doesn't make sense to us.
We have a shepherd when we're lost. God would be our shepherd. The Lord is my shepherd. But we're unworthy of such a shepherd. But you know what? He's still our shepherd. We have a great physician when we are sick. Well, I'm sick because of my own fault. I'm sick because of my own sin. I'm sick because of my own fault. It's my fault. And yet, we can cry out to the one who heals. We have a friend who sticks closer than a brother. Well, the one who's friendly will receive friends. Well, Jesus says, I don't call you slave anymore. I call you a friend. But what kind of friend have we been to him? Have you been a good friend to God? If you had a friend who treats you the way you treat God, would you say they're your friend? Would you count them among your friends? And yet, here is our God who sticks closer than a brother. We have a strong tower when we're surrounded and afraid. We can run to him and be safe. We have a savior from our sin. We have a king who we can submit to, a high priest who will atone for us. God has given us his own dear son. God is generous. And all of this is true. He's generous to the lost. He's generous more so to his people by supplying us with all the riches that come from being Christians and all the reality that is within Christianity that God has rescued us from the power of darkness, rescued us by the blood of his own son, rescued us from the wrath that is due to us, rescued us from the slavery that comes from sin, Satan, and this wicked world. And he's adopted us and brought us into his family and he's changed us and he's given us life and light and hope. He's given us his spirit. He's given us the church. He's given us the gifts. He's given us all, everything that pertains to life and godliness. That is all true. And it's meant to affect us, right? That's supposed to change us. We're not just supposed to say, "Uh uh-huh, 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 that's true, and then go out and live as though that didn't happen. That's supposed to change us. And my concern is this, that I started with the enemy of our soul lies to us. He lies to us about our God. And I I fear that what he has been communicating to us is that our God is more like what we find in Proverbs 23, 6. Do not eat the bread of a man who is stingy. Do not desire his delicacies, for he is like one who is inwardly calculating. Eat and drink, he says to you but his heart is not with you. Do you view God as stingy? You know, this is the person who says, come on over to my house, eat my food, but they're counting how many pieces of chicken you had and how many cups of Kool-Aid you had, and they're like, oh yeah, eat more, but they're calculating. And some people view God that way. Oh, he gives, but he doesn't really want to. He's generous, but he doesn't really enjoy being generous towards me. And so that view of God as stingy affects how people interact with God. But the Bible tells us, Psalm 84, 11, no good thing does he withhold from those who walk uprightly. God is generous. He supplies good. He's not stingy at all. God forbid. He's not selfish. He's not unwilling. He is kind and overflows so much in his generosity that even the wicked benefit. But he doesn't always give you everything you want. So we don't always call good what God calls good because if, as parents, if my son said, I just want to eat ice cream all day, every day, and I said, no, no. That's not good for you. That's not being unkind. That's being loving to him because I know a diet like that will lead to destruction. And God loves his children. 
And so what he gives you may not look good to you, but he is your father and loves you and is generous and only wants good for you. And so what he says no to is for your good and what he says yes to is for your good. And we think this way because we're convinced from scripture that our God is not stingy. He's generous. He's good. This is the truth about God. Romans 8.32, He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all, how will he not also with him graciously give us all things? So this should change everything about us, right? Not only did he give us his son, which there is no greater gift, not only did he save our souls, but he promised here that he will graciously give us all things that are good for us to glorify him and to extend his kingdom and to make his name holy, that his will will be done on this earth, that would conform us into the image of his son, which is the greatest desire of the Christian, right? So how would this impact the way you pray? Well, I'm not going to think he doesn't want to give, so I'm going to ask because he's generous, And he's generous to people who don't even ask. And he's generous to people who don't even say thank you. So how much more will he show generosity to his children when they ask? This should affect the way we pray. But more than just the way we pray, this should affect everything about you, Christian. 1 John 3, 1, see what kind of love the Father has given to us. There it is again given that we should be called children of God. And so we are. The reason why the world does not know us is that it did not know him. Beloved, we are God's children now, and what we will be has not yet appeared. But we know that when he appears, we shall be like him because we shall see him. We shall see him as he is. And everyone who thus hopes in him purifies himself as he is pure. He has given. He's been generous. He supplied. He has loved. He has overflowed and abundant, gracious, lavished us with all of this. And so he's loved me so much. He's given so much. How do I want to respond to that? Thank you. I want my life to be a life of thanksgiving. I purify myself as he is pure because I'm going to see him and I look forward to seeing him. Why? Because he's so good and he's so gracious and he's so worthy of honor and glory and praise and my heart is so lifted up with this love for him that I just want to respond with a thank you. I'm not doing anything to earn his merit. I'm not working to try to gain eternity. It is a response. Give thanks in all circumstances, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. It's an honor to be called a child of God. It's an honor to be a Christian. It's an honor to be saved, to be washed, to be filled, to be born again. It's an honor to be amongst the people of God. It's an honor to be given the the gifts of the Spirit. It's an honor to suffer for His name, to serve Him, to walk with Him. It's an honor. And so I want to respond with a life that says, thank you. And you say thank you by all that you do. You resist temptation. Thank you, Lord. I wouldn't dare dishonor your name. You've given me so much. You've been so generous to me. I just want to say thank you by my life of obedience. I want to say thank you in my service. I want to say thank you in my honoring, my worship, and my trust. Christianity is a life that says thank you. And everything you do is saying thank you. Well, do you see God is generous? He is generous. And even this morning, if you sit here as an unbeliever, he's been generous to you to supply you with yet another opportunity to come to faith, to repent of your sins and to believe in him. And he will give you everything necessary. Jesus said, come to the table, come to the banquet, come to the wedding feast. Everything is there. It's given freely for all who will take and eat. The church, I pray that you would be encouraged 
by the reality that God is generous. And may that generosity fuel your response to Him. Father, thank You. Thank You for Your kindness, Your overwhelming kindness. You give and You give and You give. And I pray we would respond to such generosity with thanksgiving more than just lip service, but a heart of thanksgiving that communicates and displays itself in obedience and faithfulness and holiness and gratitude. For your namesake, for your honor, we ask these things in Jesus' name.